Good evening, everyone. My name is Mina and I'm the event coordinator here at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. It is my pleasure to present this evening's artist curator talk with Beth, Beth Galston and Mara Williams. Admission for this program is pay as you wish, so if you would like to make a donation at any time, you may do so on the museum's website or visit the museum. This event is presented in connection with Beth Galston's Unraveling Oculus, which is on view through October 10th at BMAC. In tonight's program, Beth and Mara will discuss the exhibit and Beth's artistic process. You're welcome to ask questions at any time during this event, but we will save them until our time at the end. If you're here via Zoom, please use the Q&A button on your screen. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you may ask a question in the comments and we will keep an eye on those. With that being said, I would like to ask Mara Williams to join me on the screen. Thank you for that introduction, Mina. And thank you thank everyone you. out there in cyberspace who's joining us. Um, I, I should be used to doing these um, after two and a half years on Zoom, but I still find it very disconcerting um, to speak into a camera looking at myself not actually being able to make eye contact with anyone in the audience to um, have a call and response to uh, the uh, questions and the ideas being put forth and discussed. So if we get a little awkward from time to time, forgive us and forgive any technological lags that we have. It is my great pleasure to be in conversation this evening with Beth Galston. Um, in speaking with Beth earlier this week, I said, you know, You've been one of my half a dozen go-to artists over the course of 33 years. Um, this is the third, maybe even the fourth time Beth and I have worked together, um, and at least twice at the BMAC. Um, and Beth and I uh, first worked together. We started preparing for a group exhibit, which she was doing a site-specific installation on the stage area of the Union Station in 1997. So I had seen her work earlier in 1996 at the Chapel Gallery in Newton and just was taken with um, how she made real leaves dance in a space and how she animated space with natural objects. And so she came and she did a wonderful piece for us at the Brattleboro Museum and we have stayed in touch and worked together back and forth. And um, this is my culminating exhibition at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center after 33 years. So it's a great pleasure for me um, to ask Beth Galston to turn on her camera and her uh, microphone. And she can sit there and be a little bit embarrassed when I tell you that Beth, um, Beth has a distinguished career in the arts uh, because she has um, been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at, at, at MIT, and she holds an advanced degree from MIT. Um, and she also has a BFA um, from Kansas, uh, City Kansas City Arts Institute and a BA from Cornell. So she comes with us with a you know, strong academic background, but more importantly, she has maintained a rigorous studio practice for her entire career. And her career includes having National, Endo National Endowment for the Arts Awards. She's been a fellow at McDowell. She's been a fellow at Yaddo. She's been um, a resident um, at the Bunting Institute at Radcliffe um, University. So a, a number of distinguished fellowships as well. But what I really love most about Beth is her product and her process in terms of creating magical spaces, truly magical transformative spaces, um, in, both out in the environment and then bringing environmental concerns and a love of nature and attention to nature and attention to detail into um, architecture spaces and responding to that architecture um, and putting her work together. So Beth, welcome. Thank you so much, Mara. It's really been a pleasure to work with you and to, I wanna give a shout out to the whole, the entire staff at the Brattleboro Museum. It's, it's just been um, wonderful and I feel like I've been supported and everything has been really professional and I, it, it's just been an enjoyable experience. So Beth, 
once again, you're bringing nature inside, but this is a really interesting uh, process because uh, we had first started talking for this installation well before the pandemic, but your schedule just had no openings to work with me one last time. So I'll, I, I feel like we've talked about this project for six years and it started out, I was gonna do one of your light gardens and, and we had talked about um, fireflies. And by the time this happened, that happened and you finished this project and we didn't have a space that was right for your piece of that. And then the pandemic happened. You, you, you had been invited to do a site specific piece in a silo. And that led to one project and it led to a film. And then that film has been turned sort of inside out and upside down and moved into a very tall, thin space in the Brattleboro Museum. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the first project and how it fed into the second project? Okay, so it's time to share my screen. Sure. Okay, let's see if we get this right. So while you're doing that, um, I'll just tell everyone that that the still shots are just gorgeous from the show, but we we because this is a timed base, you know, so you're watching a film that spools out in time. There's a temporal aspect and a time aspect to it. When we get to the short video clips to give you an idea of what everything looks like inside the museum, they may not flow smoothly just because we're on a webinar. So tell us about this space. This is the exterior of the space that you introduced us to. Well, you're looking at two silos on a piece of land, a former farm in Groton, Massachusetts. The farm was purchased by Otto Pine, the light artist, and his wife, Elizabeth Goldring. Um, and they fell in love with those silos and envisioned that at some point, the whole space might be an art farm. Otto was the head of the graduate program I went to, and lots of alums have stayed in touch. During the pandemic, they started, several people got together, including my friend Ellen Sebring, who's the video artist that I collaborated with on, on the video in the silo. And they decided that the silos were these self-contained spaces and it was the perfect site during the pandemic to make artworks. It would be solitary and safe. And they launched this program called Silo Solos and I was asked to be part of it. And what it entailed was to, there are two silos here. The one on the left is called the bell silo and you'll find out why it has a big, amazing bell in it. And I used that space for a while kind of as my studio. So the idea was that I would bring my materials into the space, do a sculptural installation and performance and then it would become a video. Now, of course I had never done a video before um, so this became a collaborative process. And then, so there is kind of three projects in one. There was my experimentation inside the silo. There was the making of the video. And then the video was brought to Brattleboro Museum along with the materials that had been used, the installation in the silo. It, and you'll see as we proceed through, it's, it's a multi-layered project and a multi-layered space ultimately that's at Brattleboro. So let me show you, introduce you to, to the silo. Here's my husband, Jerry, walking in. The whole silo is about 25 feet high and it's got an oculus at the top. You're looking right up at the top of the silo and you can see a couple of things. You, there, a fun thing is that there's vegetation, vines are kind of growing right in. So nature is coming inside the silo. And the structure that's hanging down is a bell that is a sculpture by artist Paul Matisse. 
and he did it, he installed this in the silo as well as you'll see there's an environment with benches and it's really fun because it's a modern looking bell, but it's got a big rope and you pull on the rope and you ring the bell and it's a very, you know, it's a round space and a tall space, very, very resonant. I had never thought about sound before and working in the silo, the sound became an element that was, that I considered and that became an important part of the video. So doing this project was a little like jumping off a cliff and, <laughs> and the only, so it was, it was um, daunting, but once the opportunity that really grabbed me and made me want to continue on is first of all, how cool is it to have a silo as your studio for a while? I mean, that was just completely intriguing. And then I had the opportunity to bring my sculptural materials into the space and play. And I tried many, many things. Most of them were rejected and ended up doing a few simple things. The leaves you see on this bell rope were from to the right of the silos, there's a big catalpa tree and they've got these gorgeous heart-shaped leaves. And I didn't plant it, but it was, the leaves were, it was, you know, early summer and the leaves were filling the tree. And they also, there was a rainstorm and they fell down and they were right there for, it, it, they presented themselves to me. So I brought them in the silo and there was something about adding them to this rope, the, the color of it and bringing the nature indoors, kind of join the vines. So that was one thing I played with that I really loved. I have had a very long fascination with acorn caps and I brought two different kinds of acorn pieces into the space to play with and I loved what happened with both of them. These caps, when you drop them on the floor, create an amazing clatter. And, and in a sense, it like animated my process. I mean, one of the things that was really exciting to me is that my I was able to do things that I might play with in the studio that nobody ever sees that are incredibly interesting to me. But when you generally, when I'm exhibiting a piece, the, um, you see the final product and to be able to play with these materials and then record that on video and then have that be part of an installation, it just became completely satisfying to me. Another set of materials I played with are mirrors and they, interestingly, I mean, the natural materials I've been working with more recently, the mirrors I used in performances when I was at MIT in 1980s. And I had stored them away in my basement. And when this project came along, I had an instinct that the mirrors would be something that would work well. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a round white shape. And that is a reflection of the oculus. So the mirrors allowed me to almost bring the sky down to the earth. And then through the video, the earth kind of moved up to sky too. There was this wonderful kind of layered um, situation that came along. Another thing 
So now you get a good view of the bell rope before I had the, um, the leaves on it. This was again taken just during, during my experimentation time. And the mirrors also reflect light, which was one of the things that I was doing when I was at, at MIT. I loved these mirrors, they're flexible and they're, it, they're almost like a mosaic. It's not a, a solid panel. Each one is a separate little strip. So you get these strips of light, which I actually, in the installation, I didn't use this element so strong as you see it here because there was a video being projected and I didn't want to interrupt the video. But the video is on a loop. And I know this is hard, probably hard to envision when I'm talking about a video you're not seeing, but the video is on a loop. You're sitting in the room and it's a five minute loop and you get to the end of the video. And I didn't want people to fall out of the experience of the space. And I had a very dim light. It's actually illuminating the acorn rope that's in the space. And the light is bouncing off the mirrors. There's a, so when the, um, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, when you get to the end of the video, there's, you're getting some reflections and some shadows. So rather than just sitting and waiting for it to start again, it's a whole, it, it keeps the ambiance going. You are still in this special space. Okay, we've now gotten to the videos and I really hope that at least some of you don't, can see them, can see it moving smoothly. My apologies if that doesn't work out. Okay, th that was a clip towards, you know, I'm um, entering the silo and ringing the bell. So it's from the, be the beginning of the video. And the next one is a short clip of, I'll call it the acorn drop. And hopefully you'll be able to see this and hear this. And then the last clip is at the end of this video loop when the oculus descends and is wonderfully reflected in the mirrored panel. Okay, so now Mara and I are gonna come on the screen and there will be more visuals in a bit, but we are gonna have a conversation. Okay, one of the questions that came in um, was, is there sound? And there is sound when you're in the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. Uh, but it's not a sustained sound, it's not narrative. You could hear the bell ring and you could hear the clatter 
Um, and there's sort of an ambient soundtrack, but there, it's not, there's no narration to this, the film at all. Um, and, and it's a five minute loop. And we only showed you a 37 second clip, a nine or 12 second clip and a nine or 12 second clip. So we, we just wanted you to see and that is not just the straight video, that is the video in situ in the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. So you saw the white line. So when you come into the door of the Brattleboro Museum, you could sit on a bench right tucked up against the wall and about four feet in front of you, there's the white line, which is the do not cross and as if it were a proscenium um, in, this, in this darkened room. Uh, and then on the floor are the mirrored strips that you also see in the film. And then there are these ropes and feet and feet and feet and feet and feet of ropes made out of um, the acorn um, caps that have been strung together. She has five huge Rubbermaid boxes full of ropes. And, um, and then you see the film um, on the back wall and it's calibrated right at the floor level. So it's, it, it really, um, envelops you in the space. You're, you're actually in the space and you're only separated by four feet before the whole physical installation and the film reveals itself in front of you. And it's a very tall, thin room for those of you who are, have never been to the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center and they, you follow Beth. Uh, for those of you who have seen the show, you'll have a little more idea about what we're talking about. What intrigues me is as you could see, as, as the film showed you going up in Oculus and then Oculus is reflected in the floor. In the museum, it becomes part of the back wall. So in fact, you're going into space this way and out of space this way as well, this space and this space. So there's this complete um, almost Mobius strip of your body's relationship to the cinematic space, the filmed space, as it were. Oops, oops, oops. Through that whole thing. Was I just doing a mind show, Beth? I heard some of it, but then for some reason you got muted. Okay. The end. Okay. Well, so uh, so the feeling of both um, the silo with this giant bell in it is of a bell tower, you know, a campanile. Um, for those of you who went to college on campuses that have a bell tower, uh, those of you educated at Jesuit schools, you kind of know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Others may not. Um, the museum space is this tall, narrow space as well. It's, 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 a, it's our smallest room. It's only 11 feet wide by 17 feet deep, but it's also 14 feet high. Um, and so this, this idea of a bell tower, this idea of um, a, a, a place of worship um, is so embedded in this piece for me. Um, and, I, um, and, you know, and for me, having known Beth Rowe for <laughs> decades, I don't like to talk about how many years it is anymore. Um, her attention to nature is, nature is, is a sacred moment. It's all I can say about her work. So, Beth's like, okay, that was a big one, Mara. <laughs> so um, Beth, one of the things that everybody asks me is, you, do you string popcorn on your Christmas tree? What, what is this process of taking leaves? You, you strung leaves on top of each other for me back in the 90s, and now you're stringing acorn caps. What's the meditative process or the physical process? What's going on in your little head while you're doing that? Well, I'm not sure I can thoroughly explain why I do what I do. It's an impulse. It starts with, I mean, I take a lot of walks in the woods and that's my meditative process right there. I mean, every, every day I, I, you know, I live in Carlisle, Massachusetts, which is rural. There's a, you know, right down at the end of the street, there are paths. So I walk in the woods to 
clear my head and I don't intend necessarily to collect anything, but things catch my eye. And they simply, certain things compel me. And, you know, this whole obsession with using natural objects started for me like around 1995. And it was just one fall when New England was doing what New England always does is the leaves were falling and they were changing color. I had seen it a million times, but there was something that compelled me and something that felt incredibly poignant about it too. So I just, without knowing why, I started collecting. And my creative process is a very, um, I tend to be a bit of a minimalist. I like to find something that I feel I can work with, like a certain kind of a leaf, for example. And I like to accumulate things. It's kind of like natural growth. You're, slow, you're adding bit by bit over time until you're making, you know, kind of, you're, you're accumulating this piece over time and at a certain point, it starts to have some heft to it and feels like by using these elements that are very familiar, if you somehow just do a little something different with them, they become transformed and quite extraordinary. So I don't know if I quite answered your, your question, but I, I start with something and I play with it. And my goal is to come up with something new, something that is transformed and has some magic to it. And as a sculptor also has a, a shape or a presence that, it, that is compelling to me. Well, you know, I, I've seen you take leaves and wax individual maple leaves and turn them into something quite, you know, just animate a space completely by having them dance up a series of ropes. Um, and I've had you um, at the Brattleboro Museum um, on the, if, for those of you who know Brattleboro, in the old railroad station, there were these two maple plinths and there's um, uh, maple marble, excuse me, and marble staircase. And um, Beth took the leaves and ironed the encaustic wax and ironed the leaves into it and across the stairs and across the stage and over to the other side. And then on the stage itself, there were these giant pillars of stacked maple leaves that had all been covered in a caustic, which just, it, it truly transformed them um, into um, an object that wasn't dried and desiccated, but was luminous and pearlescent and beautiful. While that same natural structure and the, the brown of a fall changed leaf um, was fully present at the same time. Um, and um, you know, it, it, it brought the inside outside, but it, it, it somehow also um, felt like they, the, the, the leaves were being embedded on your body. And so here in this unraveling oculus, it's these little teeny caps, acorn caps, that have been strung one after the other after the other into tens of yards um, of, of strings that- 1,400 feet. 1,400 feet piling, twisting, turning, animating, becoming, um, you know, just a presence that's beyond one acorn cap. Um, and then they start ascending, you know, ascending in this vertical space. So why don't we put on some more pictures? I was just see. thinking that we should do that. Okay, so... So here are the ribbons of, and you can see one rope um, on the right-hand side of the screen ascending out of view. The one on the left is out of the picture plane right now. Here, let me, um, let me just go. Okay. This is, at, 
an image of me entering the silo. And it gives you a good sense of the layout of the room. As Mara said, it's, it's, it's actually the smallest space I've ever done an installation in. And I thought, how am I gonna make this work? I generally like to have people walking through a piece and immersed in it. And it was not possible to do that without having people walking on the mirrors or trampling the acorn caps. And on the back wall, there's a bench and somehow the room, it, I guess because of the, the use of the mirrors, the, the room becomes very expansive and it, it, it feels larger than it is in a way. Well, I think part of it is also because the silo is a round space, your perception is of depth because of the curve of the, the, I mean, the video is projected on a flat wall, but it goes deeper into space um, just because of what the shape of the video shape is. And so it feels like that you, you, it feels like this goes beyond the wall of the museum when you're in the space. Now, why don't we show a couple of other? Well, I put this slide in because one of the wonderful and unexpected things about this piece is, I mean, it's very disorienting. And what if you're, you're looking at the, the top part of the image where you see me and the rope and this structure that's part of what Paul Matisse had built into the space, that's video. And below it, so that's on the wall and the acorn caps are on the floor and the mirrors are also on the floor. But as I look at this image, it's like, it all feels like it's one space. So I'm confused as to what, what's floor and what's wall and what's two dimensional and what's three dimensional. It was rather quite unexpected but it's marvelous. I mean, when you're experiencing yeah. it, it's marvelous. Let's see if we can get to my favorite picture. Okay, so this is again, what I was talking about earlier in my introduction is you're sitting and the image is looking straight up, but it's in front of you and almost like you're in a tunnel. So it's, it's moving on a horizontal, access to you even though it's a but your brain your brain knows that it's a vertical axis looking up following the rope up so there's this incredible dislocation of space uh, you know, almost as if it's um one of those optical illusion puzzles you did when a, when you were kids you would draw a cube of lines and you could push the front of the box back and the back of the box front and flip flip the image around. Um, so it's, I, I don't know, I find it just very interesting to feel like I'm in a space and the space is clicking from horizontal to vertical to depth. Um, all, you know, just as the camera has moved. And part of that is, of course, the mirrors on the floor as well. Right. And I wanted to say something about the, the way that I, installed the acorn rope. It may not show up as, it may not be so evident from this particular slide, but I, I wanted to kind of, to mark the space by these verticals. There's the, the on the left side, there's the acorn rope is pulled all the way up to the ceiling. It's going up 14 feet high. And on the far right, there's another rope going up. And those give you an awareness of the three-dimensional space when you're in it. So I wanted to kind of, it's almost like making a drawing with these lines to encompass the space, even though I'm encompassing the air, but, but to, to activate the entire space with the video and the sculptural elements, both on the floor and, and in the air. 
I don't know if that makes sense, but that, you know, I, I made a model beforehand and I, which is the way that I work and plan out my pieces. And I, I really wanted to have it not be flat, but work with the three dimensionality of, of the space and enhance it. If that makes any sense. So here's another image that I find dislocating in the same way. You're seeing the video image looking up at the bell with the bell rope and the leaves. And that is flat on the wall, but it has a lot of dimensionality to it. And then the acorn rope kind of floats into that space, even though it's sitting on the, the ground. And then the, the reflection at the bottom of the bell is broken up into a mosaic-like pattern made by all of these strips of, of mirror. So I think that the fact that the mirrors were in strips made it just a thousand times more interesting than if it had been a solid panel and you could make out the, the exact reflection and, and it kind of shimmers as you walk by it and moves as another element to this. And it's so frustrating not to be able to just be in the space and talk, talking about this. But as you move, the reflections move, reflections in the mirrors move. And as, you well, come as, the, in, film, as the film yeah. moves and the light to dark ratio and the film changes, the, the pattern on the floor and your experience in the room shifts. Um, of course, there's no way, I mean, we have 22 participants. There's no way for us all to fit in this room at once anyway. So even if we had been there in person, it would have been frustrating. So these are the series of photographs that I, the shifts of scale, um, because you're in the space with this massing of the acorn caps, but the acorn caps are there. So they're the size of my, they're the tip of my thumb. And on the wall, you have these like serving bowl size acorns. <laughs> it's it's just, they're, they're just, just a marvelous shift of scale um, by, between the, the moving image and, and the, the you know, ropes on the floor. See, there's another one. These are, these are more like, these are like temple bells, they're so big. So I, I love the, the disjuncture, just that's the right word, the, the, the scale change between the actual caps and the projection of the caps and then the reflections. It, it's funny, you know, I obviously spent a lot of time planning this piece and I thought I knew it and then when it went up in the space, it, it's kind of like I got to know it. It had, it's like getting to know a person where there were some unexpected aspects to it that were a pleasure to discover. So it was part of getting back to what I said before about kind of leaping off a cliff to, <laughs> to do this project. The, that's the, the frightening part and the very um, satisfying part is to maybe be pushed into another territory, something that I hadn't done before. I had never done a video, as I said. I had only once done a performance, but never performing my actions being part of a video recorded uh, performing in that way. And, um, and I had never used video in installation either, which was very challenging for me technically. So all of those things that were, had not been tried before then put them together. And there's been so much to learn and to, you know, and watching others interact as well. 
Well, it's a, it's a very rich viewing experience. I hope that everyone who's on this um, webinar and, and if you know people, if you have not actually made it to the museum, it, you know, the show is open until October 10th. Um, it's well worth going. It, it, you know, being in this room with these shifts of scales, with this you know, incredible juxtaposition of, of um, uh, you know, natural material, we've all seen them, you know, you walk in a park or you are in a bedroom, I mean, a, 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 you know, a, not a bedroom, a, um, a forest, um, you, um, you encounter, you encounter them um, in nature, but, but also, you know, the acorn cap, you know, like little Thumbelina kind of storytelling with acorns when you're children. Um, but there's something complete because of the meditative aspect and this bell, this silo, this sort of chapel-like aspect because the, the benches that were designed in there, the floor that was designed in there is sort of formal and richly patterned um, the way a, you know, a church or a sacred space might be patterned. Um, it, uh, you know, I think it's a, a wonderful way to respond to nature that's been mediated by the, the vision of artists. Um, and so in here you see the, the total volume of your 1400 feet of, of acorn strings. So, so let me describe, I think you may be able to get, be able to get a sense of this in the next couple of slides that in so you're you're looking at this octagonal wooden structure which is on the floor in the center of the silo and what i did was after much experimentation i the the floor of the silo is covered by the very same mirrors that you're seeing on the floor in the room so and on top of the mirrors is my acorn rope that you can see little glints of light coming through, but they're completely covered. And then let me show you a progression here that might, so this gives you a, you can, if you look mm -hmm. at the video part of this, you know, the, the part in the back of, of the slide, you can see the little strips of mirror showing through um, the acorn caps, you can see that a little piece of the rope on the left is up in the air because it's being pulled. And if you look at this image here, it's about a minute later in the video where I had pulled a lot of the rope away, revealing the mirrors, which in turn reveals the oculus, which in turn, as, as I'm pulling this strand of rope, it's echoing the bell rope, it's echoing the vertical acorn caps ropes in the actual space. And then once the rope is all pulled away. Oh, there's a, okay, another thing here. The last section of the video in the room is, is the, the oculus is revealed. Once all of the acorn rope is pulled away, the oculus is revealed and it through the wonderful editing of Ellen, my collaborator, it, the actual, a view of the actual oculus, like when you're looking up in the silo and the reflections of the oculus, they come down and they, they join each other. And that's where the, the, the sky and, and the and ground are, are meeting in a very beautiful way. And it also, because of the way this, the oculus descends, it almost feels like it's a, like a sun, a, a, a sunset or a sunrise. Or a moon, because it's so white. Or a moon, yeah. Um, well, we have um, a, a, a couple of comments and then a couple of questions already. 
Um, one, um, Betsy Connors Chen said, uh, there's a wonderful water or pond effect, that, that rippling feeling. I think that's a beautiful observation. Um, uh, and then Jerry Russo wrote, um, it feels so familiar, it brings me back to my studio visit with you some years ago and those wonderful acorn sculptures. It almost feels like you created a camera obscura inside this silo. Always love how you blur the lines between the built and the natural environment. And then one other question was, do you have a studio assistant helping you string everything or is this part of your meditative practice? Well, you call it meditative. It's equal part obsessive and meditative, I would say. <laughs> um, I have collect, every once in a while, somebody will come out with me on a walk and help collect a few. Basically, I have collected all those acorns. I've drilled little holes in all the acorns. And you should see the drilling board from the acorns looks like a natural thing to it. It looks like it's been eaten away by insects. That's a little aside there. But I collected, lugged to my studio, spread out and dried, drilled, and strung all of the caps, except for just a couple where I might've gotten help. A lot of people have seen a lot of my shows over the years know that I just love obsessive compulsive work as well. <laughs> so um, now I'm gonna ask M Mina who's um, backstage somehow in this cyber world that we live in. I don't see any other questions in my Q and A or chat, but we also have a Facebook feed coming in. So I wanna make sure that anyone who has questions, if you put them in the Q and A or the chat um, on uh, Zoom, I can figure out how to get to them. And if, if something's coming in on Facebook, if Mina, our producer backstage, um, producing from Keene State College where she's an RA. Um, so there's nothing on Facebook. Um, so I'm just gonna give you all, um, you know, a chance to think about anything that you might like to ask Beth directly or anything about the show at Brattleboro technically um, uh, or about the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center that I might um, answer. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes to put those in. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just ask Beth, are there other images that we had wanted to share? I, I, I don't, I've lost track of where we are. No, th this was, this was the last image. Right. That's but, well, why don't you pull, our, pull us up nice and big again? Pardon? You can, why don't we go out of screen share? Okay. Because um, that makes it easier for me to see the chats and the Q&As. Um, so, um, Beth, what have you got coming up next? Where? If people want to see more of your work, they all have to get here by October 10th, but beyond that, what projects are you working on? Where might people interact with your work again? Well, I have concurrently, I have a show up at Chesterwood in Stockbridge. Not far from us at all for our yeah, local. I've really been going back and forth between the two places and it's called Ice Forest and it's a walkthrough installation and it's in a former, uh, a gallery that was a former woodshed. And it, the thing that I really enjoyed about um, this installation is that although I have exhibited ice forest before, this, the fact that it's a, a former woodshed, it has a wall of windows, the outside, you can see to the outside and there's a, wonderful connection between the ice forest inside and the natural world outside. After that, uh, I am relocating a sculpture in Cambridge that's been moving, been going to go from one park to another. And I will finally return to my studio and I'm working on a project with decayed leaves, writ large. They're very large 
um, prints of, of decayed leaves that are big enough so that you can, they're bigger than you. And you can have this sense of scale of a, a, new, a new experience of a leaf. And as well, there are some um, laser cut felt components of these decayed leaves. So I will return to trying to finish up that, that series, which has been going along very slowly for quite a while. And I'm eager to pull the 2D and 3D components together to-, well, to I've, seen some of the raw, I've seen some of the raw material from that. And it's quite, it's gonna be quite exciting. Completely different scale than I've ever worked with you at. So it's very exciting. Okay, so now we have a few questions, Miss Beth. Okay. Um, and I, I just, uh, what, this is Sally Weber. And is this Sally Weber, the art historian from CUNY, I wonder? But it says B. Sally Weber, artist, or sorry, okay, so because she's another said, MIT alum. Okay, so it's a different Sally yeah. Weber than the art historian okay. I know. Um, this was produced during COVID, I think. Any reflections on that? Hmm. Well, I know that some of the artists who were working in the Silo Solos project explicitly kind of responded to that. I, I'm not sure how my, what I did relates to COVID. Um, except that the things that I was doing, I mean, I could safely walk in the woods. I, the, my process, could continue on during COVID. And then the fact that I was coming into the silo and that was a self-contained space, I, I was nourished and protected in, in making this, this piece. Okay, now we have a, a, a comment. I believe this comment is from Julia Shepley. Is beautiful and transformative images, thank you. I hope to see it in person. And then Sally Chapman hey. asked, and I, Sally, I think might know you because she says Beth. <laughs> um, the piece looks wonderful. Do you think you will use video again? And are there other elements or processes that you will incorporate in the future? Ah, well, I don't have a crystal ball, but I using video was quite fascinating. And, you know, one thing we didn't talk about so much is the, I've always used, my, my environments have always been multi-layered and the layering of the video. I, I mean, I'm, I'm very tempted to try using it again. I don't have, an immediate thought of what I might do, but I, I like the way that it expanded the space. I like that it, the way that it, it created a, a sense of a narrative, but there's not really one, but it created a flow over time of some actions that were echoing what I had built and placed in the space. So I, I'm very open to it. And I just can't say for sure what I would do, but I, I would consider it because it, it feels like it just added some other dimension to my work that I'm still really pondering that, that surprised me and delighted me as well. So I hope so. Right. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions um, unless Mina has something for Facebook. I just want to remind everyone that the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center is at 10 Vernon Street in the former Union Railroad Station. It's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year and the, the train station is now well over 100 years old and beautifully maintained. Um, and the museums are closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. So do not show up on a Monday or Tuesday, but we're open 10 to 4. Um, and right now we're still under our COVID, please pay anything that you'd like to pay. Um, but always um, 
things are interesting at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. And if you're a member, you know all the things we're doing at any given time. So let's see, I think one other question came in. Hold on a sec. Um, one, two, three, four, let me just see. It says five. Ah, here we go. From Sue Johnson. This this installation makes me think of cabinets of curiosities in which the artificial and the natural are presented in a new way. This is moving up and down um, to understand the universe. Um, the strung acorns reminded me of nautilus shells with gold filigree additions and so forth. Magical objects of nature transformed. That Sue is also an artist and an art professor, so that's a beautiful observation, Sue. Thank you. And there are now no open questions. So Laura, um, maybe do you have any parting question for me? A parting question for you. Well, I always want to know what you're up to again, besides Chesterwood and your ice ice forest. Um, no, I think I, you know, I think your imagery speaks for itself, and the idea of of the Oculus as a setting moon or a, a setting sun, where um, the heavens, whether it's a planetarium or it's a a dome in a beautiful chapel, an Oculus in a um, the Pantheon, for instance, or a humble building um, such as the um, as the silo, you know, you've made this beautiful um, conflation of interior, exterior, man-made, natural-made, and the movement of the universe. So I think it's a very special piece and I congratulate you. Thank you. And what you were saying, I, I um, there's just an image I wanna share that I haven't, it hasn't become an artwork, but you when you said the setting moon, but one night I was out at night taking my walk through a meadow at the end of the street. And I saw a light behind the tree and it was a very orangey light. And I really, it was the moon and it was a color that I, it was huge and I had never seen it that color before, but it was, it was a very strange unnatural color. And it turns out the wildfires in California were putting dust in the air here. So that beautiful, strange image was the result of what's was going on. Well, what's going on everywhere. But um, I don't know what I would do with this image, but it's it stuck in my head and it may become something at some point. Call me when it does. I'll come wherever you are to see it. Well, I would like to thank the 20 or so people who joined us um, for the presentation and hope to um, entice you to Brattleboro if you haven't seen the show yet. I know some of you um, are far and wide. You're not here with us tonight. You're, you're out there in, in the world. Um, and I would like to thank you, Beth, for um, all the time and effort and thoughtfulness uh, and creativity that you put in all your artwork, but also um, your generosity over the course of <coughs> years to the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. <laughs> and thank you, Laura, so much. You're welcome. And thank you all for joining us. Um, it is a pleasure. Um, I wish sometime we could all do this in person. It's much more enjoyable that way. But but then the, the people who came in from Maine or Delaware, wherever you were, wouldn't have been able to be with us. So there is something there is something good in this technology. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Mara and Beth, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate having you here. Mara, you very eloquently phrased everything about the museum's hours and location, took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, once again, free programming like this is provided by the museum, thanks to our generous donors. So if you'd like to make a donation, you can go to brattleboromuseum.org slash support. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Beth. Love Bye. to Jerry.